Okay, hello everyone. Um, so this is the first of the uh, new way of lecturing, uh, video lectures. <clears throat> now I'm not constrained to uh, keep a lecture to 50 minutes uh, or extend it to 50 minutes. So what I've decided to do is to break it into smaller pieces, um, focusing on uh, one to three topics per video. And this is the first one, and I have been experimenting with the software in order to put pictures and pictures and overlay uh, plots. Uh, however, at this point, I don't have any of that uh, going, so this would be a very straightforward um, movie where I'll, I'll present a couple pictures, but right from the book. So I'm actually talking about a topic today that's um, called Center of Mass, which is abbreviated C. O M with the O small. The uh, section for this topic is 9.8. Now in chapter 9, center of mass is explored in a lot of detail because it's important for the topics there. We just need to know the basics um, for the center of mass for the, our work in chapter 12. Anyway, if you want more information, you can go see uh, section 9.8. So this is a, actually the first lecture for chapter 12, but just hopefully uh, giving you the basics on one of the concepts we need for chapter 12. All right, so what is the center of mass is a question. Um, I've written a definition here that's a little bit different than the book. I think it's a bit more intuitive. Um, so for the center of mass, it says that point in space associated with an extended body that exhibits the translational motion as derived by Newton's laws. So as you know, uh, pretty much every body we worked with, whether it be car, blocks, um, you know, things rolling down uh, uh, inclines, we've always treated it as basically a point particle. So there's no question with the position of the object. However, what if you have an extended object? What is that point in space that follows the trajectories that we have been calculating? Okay, that would be the center of mass. And it's a good idea to take a look at um, figure 9.21 in your book to get an idea of the importance of this. So I'm going to put that up there now. See if I can get that in the frame here. Yeah. So here we have a diver doing uh, a non-trivial dive, right? Doing a, a flip as they go into the water. And you see the parabolic motion that we have calculated for objects in free fall. However, that trajectory really only applies to the center of mass of the person, somewhere in shown here in their abdomen. If we had decided instead to trace the trajectory of so let's say the toes, you can see they do not follow the same curve. And sometimes they're you know, inside, sometimes they'll be outside this trajectory. And actually that would look very complicated if you tried to uh, <clears throat> uh, actually calculate that. But the center of mass actually simplifies the calculation of a point in a body at least its uh, position as a function of time. So that's the significance of it. All right. So even though you won't really need this for the work in chapter 12, it will help conceptually to understand it. Uh, so for a rigid extended body, we can, uh, which our diver was not, but I'll show you another example in a moment. For a rigid extended body, we can separate the motion into two parts. We can calculate the motion of the center of mass just as we've been doing this semester, and two, the orientation of the body with respect to the center of mass. Okay, so that directs us to figure 9.22, and that's at the bottom here. Let's see if we can get a good picture here. I don't think you need to see all of it, but it's a wrench, and a wrench cannot change its sort of uh, shape as the diver did, so this is a little bit easier to understand. So you throw a wrench, and let's ignore the, the fall, just say it goes in a straight line, okay? So that's the trajectory of the center of mass. Um, if we look at this hole here on the handle, 
we'll see that it's rotating, right? It's going around the center of mass. So if we divide the motion into two parts, that is of the center of mass, right? And then the orientation of the wrench, say the angle it makes with, you know, with respect to the X or horizontal direction, we just need one angle to specify, uh, you know, where that little hole is in the wrench. And it just rotates around the center of mass. Okay, so you take a complicated motion and you divide it into two. Now, in chapter 12, we're going to talk about applying forces to an object where the net force is zero. But for this wrench, I could apply a net force of zero, which means the center of mass won't move, but it will still rot I could still make it rotate about the center of mass. And in chapter 12, we're dealing with statics. So we want not only the center of mass at rest, but we want no rotation about the center of mass. And that will involve the topic or the concept from the next lecture, which is torque. We have to have both the force and the torque to be zero, to have both the center of mass at rest and no rotation. And so that's what this uh, center of mass topic is about. Um, we understand what it is, and then we'll later calculate uh, the torque about the center of mass, and we'll make sure that that's zero. So don't worry about whether you uh, understand torque yet. I'm just telling you why we're studying the center of mass. It would be much easier uh, if we break these two concepts into two lectures. Okay? All right. So check those figures out. Make sure you understand what's going on there. I'll put my book to the side here. Um, let's see. Where's my little paper to cover text so you don't read ahead? Turn the page. All right. Now, as a matter of vocabulary, I should say a few things. So, for our purposes, center of mass and center of gravity are the same thing, okay? And that's the case in most applications. So, if you, if you see your book using center of gravity, just plow on. It's just talking about the center of mass. Only in very special situations will they be different in cases that we don't care about. So... What do I mean by that? Well, here is a ruler, and it's symmetric about the center, except for it does have this little extra hole here, but that's a small uh, correction. It's not going to affect what I'm saying. Just pretend that that hole on the right side is not there. The two holes inside that uh, length are symmetric. So what I have here is a balanced ruler. And what that means in this case, since our ruler is symmetric, I have as much mass on the left side as I do on the right side with respect to that center circle. I'm placing my finger right underneath that center circle. And so that's the center of mass, but it's also the center of gravity because the force on each side of my finger due to gravity is just going to be the mass times g. And since g is the same side on each uh, side of the ruler, and the mass is the same, then the center of gravity is the same as the center of mass. Okay? Um, in fact, if we pretend this is a uniform mass distribution, and it almost is, um, <clears throat> any little piece of mass I pick up anywhere of uh, the same amount will have the same gravitational force on it. So since the for gravitational force is constant over the ruler, then the center of mass and center of gravity will be the same. All right. Now, I will use the term center of mass, though, I think most of the time when I'm referring to that. All right. Well, there is something else special about that uh, ruler um, that doesn't necessarily be the, uh, have to be the case. And let me just state this. There's another term you might have heard in high school called the geometric center. I'll give you a few examples in a moment. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to say is that sometimes but not always, the center of mass and the geometric center are the same. But really, we should be very careful about using those terms interchangeably. Only for symmetric objects is that going to be true. And let's discuss how 
this uh, may not be true. Okay, let me scroll down here. So what I thought I'd do is give you a few examples and then a couple of counter examples. All right, so the let's take these as flat plane objects here. And I just put down some basic shapes, a circle, an equilateral triangle, and then a square. Okay, and we'll say that the mass is uniform. All right, over the object. So that's just defined up here. Uniform mass objects. Um, <clears throat> well, I can find the center of mass easily in these uh, nice simple cases. All I have to do is find the geometric center. We know that's at the center of the circle, the center of the equilateral triangle, that's easy to find, and the center of the square. So these are not only the geometric centers, but they're also the center of masses. Very easy in that case. So those are examples where they're the same. Let me now give a counterexample. Um, here is the square again. But now I've got it shaded in so that the density in the sh heavily sh shaded region is actually larger. It's more dense than in the light shaded area up here at the top. Okay, so if I drew, now if I drew a line through the middle now and vertically through the middle, you know, I could find the geometric center. There it is. Now, if I look left to right, that's fine. I'm going to have equal mass on each side. So I have actually found the in the horizontal direction, there is the X center of mass. <clears throat> but it's different vertically, right? Because above the line of the geometric center, I have less mass than I have below the line. So the center of mass is actually going to be lower in the Y coordinate. than the geometric center. So let me just write that here, the Y center of mass. So we do have to be careful. There are plenty of examples we may work with where the geometric centers and the uh, center of masses will be different. Here's another case that's simple. Um, here I have an eraser, which is a different density than the wood in the pencil which is a different density of the metal. And if we go to this end, we see the wood gets shaved down until uh, the lead is exposed. So the density at the tip here is, you know, it's basically the density of lead, which is very light. And, <clears throat> and so surely if I find, I use this shape to find its geometric center, that's going to be very different than if I found the center of mass. All right. So hopefully that nomenclature is straight now we can use center of gravity center of mass interchangeably but don't confuse the center of mass with the geometric center all right another thing you need to be aware of is that the center of mass uh, does not always have to be within the body it's a point associated with the body but it doesn't have to be inside the matter of the body so here's a simple example where we have a square-like object, but it's a empty picture frame. And that, in that case, we can intuit that the center of mass is going to be obviously for this symmetric object there, but there's no material there. Okay, a bit more interesting example is the boomerang, right? So obviously there's some symmetry about this line here. It's like a mirror image, so I can think that the center of mass is along this line, but it's a little bit different in this perpendicular direction. I have, If I draw a line sort of right here, then there's some mass over to the right side and left side. I just have to find where that is equal, and we'll talk about what that means in a moment. And so it's for boomerang, it could very well be outside the body altogether, okay? All right, so another idea we should be aware of that might be useful in Chapter 12 is that we can determine a center of mass for a collection of objects. And for that example, I'm using point objects 
Um, so I just have four point particles drawn here. And it's a nice simple case. I have um, all the objects have the same mass. Okay. The y coordinates of the upper two are 1, and the y coordinates of the bottom two are negative 1. So I have 2m at negative 1 below the x axis and 2m at 1 above. And so by symmetry, we might certainly uh, conclude that the x center, I'm sorry, that the y center of mass is going to be 0. There'd be no other reasonable choice. Now looking horizontally, well, I have 2m at the chord x coordinate 2 and 2m at the x coordinate 5. So um, I want the middle there, right? And that's just going to be, well, 5 minus 2 is 3 divided by 2 is 1.5. And then I add that to 2 and I'll get uh, 3, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, what did I say? Yeah, 3.5. So the x center of mass equals 3.5, and that's meters, let's say. All right, so here's my notation for the vector for the center of mass, and that's going to equal uh, 3.5 meters and 0. All right, so that just shows you that you can have a system of objects, and they, they themselves have center of masses or center of mass, I should say. All right. Hopefully, we've addressed the qualitative issues now. Um, so we want to move now from qualitative understanding to quantitative. What that means is we want a formula uh, to calculate the center of mass. So in order to demonstrate that this is important to have, what I've done here is I, I said, what if, I actually put a question mark in there, what if I have a collection of point masses with various masses and not in a not very symmetric uh, locations? So here I have, uh, if you can see it, let's see what we got, 4m. So we'll use our unit as m. Pretend it's a kilogram, whatever you like. Um, so that would be 4 kilograms and 2.5 kilograms, 3.1 kilograms, kilogram, 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 and then 1.2 kilograms all various masses, and then they're laid out at sort of like looking almost random locations. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to look at this and use symmetry in, uh, in order to find the center of mass, and so we do need a formula. And here it is. Well, let me put that there. So we need a general formula for calculating center of mass. The vector RCM is equal to the uh, x center of mass, y center of mass, z center of mass. So each one can be calculated separately. And it's the same formula for all three. So I'll just give you the formula for uh, the x coordinate. Okay? All right. So if we have some number of objects, we'll call n. Um, for the x coordinate, I take. The, the first object, whatever I decide is number one, uh, its mass times its uh, x position. And I add to that the second mass times its x position, plus dot, dot, dot for all the masses, the same quantity, just add it in until you get to the last one, the mass of the nth objects times its x position. All right, that's the numerator. And the denominator is just the sum of the masses, okay? And that just normalizes the expression. Um, if we want to use the summation notation in order to express that same formula, I say sum from i equals 1 to n, the, the, the uh, products, uh, the product, excuse me, of the mass of the object times its position. All right, and that's divided by the sum of the masses. And of course, the sum of the masses is just the total mass of the system, which we'll call big M. That's defined right here, okay? And so we'll end up with this expression for calculating the x-coordinate of the center of mass uh, for a system of particles. And this works in every case. Okay, you don't need any degree of symmetry. It works for the case I just showed you up above. All right, you have exactly the same formula for y and z if you just plug in for everywhere you see an x, you plug in a y or a z.
give an example. Now, what I will say is that there are simpler examples in your book, if you want to go through them just to sort of harden this idea in your head. Example 912 and 913. Okay? But I want to do something a little bit more interesting. Um, it's not that much more interesting. But what I did is I laid out an equilateral triangle, or I placed masses at the vertices of an equilateral triangle. Okay? And it's a bit more interesting than the book because I do use different masses. So at the bottom here, at these two vertices, I put in a mass M and a mass M, and then at the apex, I put in 4M. All right? So we use a little geometry. We can get those coordinates, and then we'll calculate uh, the um, uh, center of mass. And just there's, on the right side here, if you want to be reminded of the height of the equilateral triangle, I just go through, I use Pythagorean. You could also use L sine 60 degrees, those internal angles and in the equilateral triangle are 60 degrees. So you need to remind yourself, uh, we need that to find uh, the Y coordinate for the apex uh, mass. All right, so obviously I made it simple for us for one of the masses. I placed it at the uh, origin of the coordinate system. So R1 is equal to 0, 0. It's X and Y position, 0, 0. Okay? Uh, R2 is still along the x-axis, so its y-value is 0. And we're saying the length of the side is L, so its x-coordinate is L. So that's pretty straightforward. Now, the x-coordinate of the third particle here at the apex, you know, it's got to be halfway along uh, the x-axis here. And so that's L over 2. And then I just use the height of an equilateral triangle, which is the square root of 3 over 2L. That's about 0.433L. And so we have all the coordinates for all three points. Okay? Now, in advance, I'll go ahead and calculate our denominator, the total mass. That's just the sum of the masses. M plus M plus 4M. That's 6M. All right. So we have that. All right. For the X position, I just use our formula, mass times positions, summed over for each object. I have M for the first object, M0. Let's get that in the frame here. I have M times 0 plus, for the second object, M times L plus 4M, its mass, times L over 2, its X position. Okay, and that's divided by 6M. And that's a pretty straightforward calculation. The numerator is 3 times M times L. And... Um, divided by 6m, which gives us L over 2, and that we would have intuited by symmetry. All right, well, let's look at the y-coordinate now. We have m times 0 plus m times 0, because the y-coordinates for both masses at the bottom is 0, and then we have plus 4m times the y-position of that apex mass, which is square root of 3 over 2L, and we divide all that by 6m, and that works out to be L over the square root of 3. That's because this one gives you um, 2. When you do 4 over 2, you get 2 times root 3 divided by 6. That's one-third of root 3. That's written here. And it's actually uh, equal to L over root 3. But I think let's use this expression to see if this makes physical sense. Recall, um, oop. That's, that's mislabeled. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Recall that the height here is root 3 over 2, right? Well, this is one, uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, two-thirds of that. That's one-third root 3, right? Instead of one-half. Let's go up to our picture here. I'll try to draw it two-thirds. And this would be the position of the center of mass. All right, that is, it's at L over 2 in X, and then a little bit above the geometric center, which is half the height uh, down here, that would be root 3 over 4. Uh, so this is a case, of course, since the masses change by position, uh, the geometric center is not going to be the same as the center of mass. Um, and so it's a little bit higher because that mass at the apex is... A lot larger, so that makes sense. Okay, all right. 
So our final answer here, the center of mass is L over 2 for x and L over root 3 for y. All right, so we have one more example here. Now i got to do some setup first, and then I'll do the example. Uh, what I, the situation would be quite straightforward. Think of a, a ruler or a thin rod that we place on a coordinate system where it's along the x-axis here. Um, <clears throat> so it's a rod of mass m and length l. And in order to make our discussion a little bit simpler, we want to define a quantity that we've used before, the linear density, which is uh, lambda, we call that lambda, and it equals the mass divided by length. So, so it's the amount of mass in a particular length of the rod. All right. Now, just to set things up, let's think about just taking a segment of this rod. Um, and I chose here the segment from L over 4 to 3 quarters L. And that's really half the rod. So we would expect to get half the mass from half the rod, all right, because it's uniform density. Um, that's, you know, not so tricky. The way we would get that quantitatively is delta M, the amount of mass in a piece of the rod, equals lambda, its linear density, times the, uh, the length of the rod that we've chosen, okay? Well, the length of the rod is, that we've chosen in our picture here is equal to 3L over 4 minus L over 4, and that's L over 2, okay? So delta M equals the linear density times that um, unit of length, which is L over 2. We can see L cancels, and I get M over 2, just like we expect. So that's a finite example, um, uh, you know, for a finite piece of the rod, and it, that, I just told you that in order to set up thinking about the infinitesimal uh, equivalent. And the infinitesimal equivalent is a little bit of mass dm, so we change that delta to d, is also equal to lambda times dx. And here I show a little differential element of the rod, dx, right? We, which, you know, in the integral goes to zero, but... You know, we don't worry about such things. We just think about it as a very, very tiny piece of the rod. And the same relation applies. So now, understanding that, we can translate our calculation of the center of mass for a collection of objects to this uh, equivalent definition for the center of mass for a continuous object. And we use our standard description where we see a summation, we put an integral sign, and then we have to put in a differential element. And so that is, we have to integrate over each, at each position, multiply by the amount of mass at that position. And then we also divide again by the integration of all the little pieces of mass in the rod, which will give us the total mass. So the denominator doesn't change, the numerator becomes an integral. And so we state the, for the x position, we have the same formulas uh, for the y and z's. The x center of mass is equal to the integral of x dm over the total mass. And let's go one more step. The integral of lambda dx, or lambda x dx, where lambda dx, we've substituted for dm here because we want... Uh, we're integrating over x, so we want to have our integrand expressed in x. So that's the expression you should familiar si familiar si familiarize yourself with. All right. So a little sample calculation for how that works. Pretty straightforward. Here I have our rod again. Length L. Total mass M. Let's move that up. And use our formula, x center of mass equals, here we have that lambda x dx, but now I'm, I've placed the left end of the rod at 0, the right end at L, so that will be our integration range. And that will equal, well, lambda is just a constant, we move it out. It's easy to integrate x dx, that's x squared over 2. We evaluate it at L, subtract the evaluation at 0, 
and that gives us for the x coordinate lambda l squared over 2 over m. That doesn't look so nice. But then we remember well, lambda times l, remember lambda equals m over l, so if I multiply by uh, l, I'm just going to get the mass. And I, so in the next step, I get m over m, which cancels, and I'm left with l over 2. Is Now, that's exactly what we would expect. But I, we used our heavy-duty calculation, and then because it's a simple problem, we can check the answer. Okay, so that's a method of, uh, of getting the center of mass for a continuous object. Hopefully, we've developed our intuitions and in... When we're talking about statics in chapter 12, remember we want the motion of the center of mass to be zero, that is zero velocity, and we also want no rotation about the center of mass, so it is necessary to understand what the center of mass is. And that's the end of this concept. We will go on to torque in the next video, which I hope to get up uh, hopefully before the end of the night, but if not, it will be early in the morning. Okay. All right. Have a good night.